your financial advisors. A registered investment advisor, this show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al, hanging out here on a Saturday. Thanks for tuning in. Um, answering your email questions. Not really yours. Investopedia's email well, you, questions. Well, there were your, your questions that you sent to Investopedia. I suppose, yeah. All right. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep rifling these things off. Okay. You got another one? I sure do. Yeah. Um, why do I need to diversify my 401k? Okay. okay. So that's the title, Alan. Okay. Uh, here's the summary. My 401k plan offers very low cost stocks and bond index funds. I still have 15 to 20 more years t- to go until retirement. If I invest in the S&P 500 or indexes, etc., cetera, um, they have shown approximately a 10% average return over the last 40 years. Why do I need to diversify my 401k in the next 10 to 15 years? So I'm, I gather they're maybe they're trying to they're trying to are they sort of asking why do I want anything other than stocks? Do you think that's kind of what they're getting into? I think so. Let's see. My 401k plan offers very low cost stocks. All right, point zero three percent in bond funds. I have twenty years to go to re- my retirement. So if stocks have shown approximately a ten percent average rate of return over the last forty years, why do I need to diversify? Yeah, I think I think the the question is why do I need bonds exactly, or why do I? I mean, if because the S and P is giving me ten percent over the last forty, why don't I just keep it in the S and P for the next ten, fifteen to twenty years and get my ten percent rate of return? Yeah, because bonds have earned what two, three, four percent, and then there's other kinds of stocks too. There's international stocks, there's emerging markets, and but S and P has done well. Yeah, but here's the reason: because it, it's not a guaranteed rate of return. Yes, it's an average rate of return. So the next 10 years could be just like 2000 through 2009 when the S&P was down close to 10% for that 10-year time period. So a 10-year period, you started with 100,000, you ended up with 90,000. 90. You're down. 10 years. 10 years. You were down. Compounded interest that, negative. That, that doesn't sound like 10% per year. No, it doesn't, does it? No. So what, it's like, well, are they lying to me? No, over a 40-year time period, the longer you go, the better the numbers are going to look. Sure, of And the closer you get to retirement, that means you have to diversify. So if you have 40 years to retirement, I'm fine with you being all in 100% stocks. That we, we just talked about with this 29-year-old. Right. But now it's like, hey, well, I'm 20 years from retirement. Okay, well, 20 years is different than 30 or 40 years. Or maybe it's 15 years. So the closer you get to retirement, what you're trying to do is to protect from the downside. We all like the upside appreciation of stocks, but the downside is what kills you in retirement. Because when you start pulling dollars out to create your retirement income, and if you're still 100% invested in equities or stocks, and you take income from that, it's difficult to get caught back up. Because if the market drops 20% and you're taking another 3% or 4% out of the portfolio, Right, that's a twenty-five percent depletion. Sure. So now you need a thirty-three percent, roughly. I'm guessing on that rate of return, just to get your cap, just to get back to square back, one, back to even, just yeah. to you get back to even. And as you continue to start taking money out, and if the markets will decline, maybe another year, right? And now it's going to be even that much more challenging to get your money back. Bonds are there to even out the ride, to even out the overall portfolio. Yeah, and Joe, the other thing I would say is is when you look at stocks as well, international stocks, for example, they're somewhat correlated with the United States stock market, but not completely. And in fact, you see many periods of time where the U.S. stock market is doing very well and international stocks are not, and vice right versa. Now. Which is right now, right? Which is the last five Co- yeah, years. Yeah, a couple of years. Yeah, uh, what, well, yeah. yeah, emerging markets have done well this year. But and, they, had, uh, they had done very poorly. And so so going back to 2000 to 2010, international stocks and emerging markets did really well. And so if you had, let's say you had half of those and half domestic stocks, you know, you probably earned 6 or 7%, whereas the people that just had the U.S. stocks, well, they went down. They, they went down 10%. But the, the, here's the problem. It's called recency bias. True. Right? 
And what that means is that, okay, well, here we tend to continue to purchase and buy or load up on asset classes or areas of the market that have performed well. And we all know that that's the wrong thing to do, but we continue to do it. Right. Because it's like, well, I want to stay out of, um, you know, international markets right now with everything that's going on, you know, with Brexit and what's going on and, you know, every, you know, whatever country and uh, it does, you know, emerging markets. Are you kidding me? What? They're down, right? So they look and they're like, well, it's down 20%. I don't want to put good money after bad. Right. Yeah. That's but a, it's down. That's when you should be that's buying. That's when you right? should be buying emerging markets. Good case in point. I mean, you look at the lab until this year, you look at the last three years or so, maybe even four years, that's been a horrible asset class. And in fact, I've talked to people. Well, it, it, not a horrible asset class. The asset class has performed horribly. Yes. How okay. That? Oh, all right. That's, yeah, that's more accurate. All right. Yes. Good. And so people sell out of it because, well, this, you can't make money in emerging markets. Now, this year, it's way up. And the truth is, when you take a long term average of different asset classes, more often than not, emerging markets is either the top performing asset class or right near the top. Because right. it's extremely volatile and it's right. risky. Because of that risk, you right, you should expect a higher rate of return or you wouldn't invest Correct. in those particular areas of the market. Yeah, so the key there, it's not that you want to go all in because that's way too risky, but you want to have a little measured piece of emerging markets in your portfolio. If that's going to be a really good long-term performer, have some of that in there. You don't want all your investments in it because it's way too big of a roller coaster, right? I mean, you're talking about it'll go down 50% one year and then up 80%. It'll go down 10%. I mean, it's all over the place. Right. It would be ideal if we had the crystal ball and say, all right, well, yeah, if the U.S. markets are going and continue to do 10% for the next 15 years, yeah, of course, then don't do anything else, right? right? A 10% growth rate, that would be phenomenal. But the likelihood of that happening is very slim to none. So going back to the question, why do I diversify? Why do I need to diversify? Because you never know what asset class is going to perform. And as you get closer to retirement, you don't necessarily want to be all in the stock market. Because what if you're about to retire, and then we have another great recession, and then it takes two, three, four, five years to get your money back. You, are you, is that fear? Are you trying to put fear in this poor just man? Just trying to, trying to say that's why we like diversification. Because uh, I like to look at it like, let's say Alan has a 100% stock portfolio, right? and I have a 50% stock portfolio. Right. Once you get close to retirement, you have to protect on the downside. Yes, agreed. Right. So it, let's say the market goes down 20%. Alan's portfolio goes down 20%. My portfolio goes down 10 Right, because so, you're, you're half in. Because I'm only half in. And so when the market goes back up, I don't need nearly as much of a rate of return to get my capital back than Alan does, right? But yeah, on up markets, he's going to make more money than I am. But what is the goal of the money? Is the goal of the money? Because here's two scenarios. When you look at retirement, you could be dead broke at 75. You blow through all your money. Or you could have millions at death. Which one's better? I don't know. Maybe you want to bounce the last check to the mortuary. And now I have all these millions because I was too afraid to spend it. Because I, right? right? You see the analogy there now? Why are so, you giving me some dirty looks here? It, 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 it doesn't make sense to you? Not really. <laughs> some people don't necessarily want to leave a legacy. I understand that. It had nothing to do with your prior point. What do you mean? I'm saying if, if, if you're taking on more risk than I am. Yeah. Right? Why take on the added risk is what I'm saying. Yeah, I agree with that. I so think why that, didn't that correlate? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, if it, when you get to retirement, you could either have millions when you when you when you die, right? Or you could run out of money at seventy five. Why not have a more predictable rate of return? Sure, right? So that that you have more certainty in your retirement. But I think both scenarios, depending on the goals. Yes. If I say, you know what, I I don't have any kids, and I want to have the best retirement for me. Yes. So I don't necessarily want to die with millions. Yeah, I, agreed. Okay, right? Great. But maybe you have children and you want to pass a legacy and things like that. So that's your goals. So sure. it depends, of course, on what people are trying to accomplish. That's why planning is so important. <laughs> it is. Now, do we have a planning special? Uh, yeah. So I don't know. What, what, do you, what do you want to know? <laughs> do we have a planning special? Uh, yeah, you can go to our website at purefinancial.com. There's all sorts of specials. <laughs> that's right next to the spam. <laughs> Yeah, just go down aisle six. 50 recipes on how to cook spam. Yeah, there you go. Right, Go down aisle six, and then you get your own little free retirement master plan right there. <laughs> you might get a can of spam with it. 
Oh, boy. All right, we got to take another break. Uh, don't go anywhere. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Now back to Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here, certified financial planner. I'm with Alan Klopine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, appreciate you listening. Go to our podcast at iTunes if you missed any of the show. We do a two-hour show, uh, but we break it down to about, um, I don't know, what's the podcast? Maybe an hour and probably. a half? Yeah, probably. And in, in that, I, I thought you were going to say 10 minutes. We, we <laughs> yeah, we broke the, it. We saved the best part. <laughs> yes. Sometimes it's a couple minutes. Yeah, it's about seven minutes. <laughs> um, we're uh, answering some questions here and having some discussion about them yeah so this is what investopedia yep people uh, write questions into investopedia and then investopedia sends it to you that's right and here we go answering mm. the questions live on the radio yeah they said below are a few of our latest questions that have been submitted all right so all right alan you've been a real estate investor for how long oh i don't know 35 years 35 years so you know one or two things about real estate yes i do okay and so here's a good question for you okay uh, should I invest in real estate or index funds? Both. Yes. All right. I, I, I like both, but what's, yeah. He's got 60K that he wants to invest. Okay. I have a yearly net income between 45 and 60K, and I'm living on $30,000 a year now. Okay. So is he retired? My plan is to put 15K into a SEP IRA for the long term. That leaves me with 45000 to invest somewhere else. Okay. I am fiscally conservative, so a mutual fund that has municipal bonds seems like a good idea, but interest rates will probably go up, thus leaving my principal shrinking. Real estate seems like it could be a good move with historically low interest rates, especially for a first-time homeowner. However, homes in my area seem to be overvalued, 25% higher than in my neighboring towns. How should I invest my excess money? Is investing in real estate a good idea? Should I put my money in a savings account at a local bank at one percent and wait for the or wait for the bubble to burst? Okay, good. Oh, this there's, there's individual a lot. needs some education. <laughs> there's a lot there, Joe. I'm going to start with the real estate part. Now, he, he's never owned a home. First time home buyer. It sounds like. Well, so, I mean, or he hasn't owned a home in what two years? Yeah. So, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> if you want to get technical? Yeah. So let's. I'll go down a couple angles there, and I'll let you talk about index funds. All right. How about that? Sure. And I agree with your assessment. You should do both. But uh, right off the bat, uh, if you don't own a home, I, th I think it's great for everyone to own a home because if you rent and I mean, if you're going to stay in an area long term, if you're not going to stay in an area long term, it's much better to rent because when you buy a home, it's a lot of closing costs to buy the home. And when you sell the home, there's even more closing costs because of the realtor charges. So is if you're going to hold a property long term or you're going to stay in an area long term, yeah, it's great p probably to, to buy a home if it's a home to live in. Um, so do we look at homes to live in as investments? Not, not really. I mean, sometimes they become good investments, but that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose of buying a home is to live in a place that you want to live and have a quality of life. That's, you know, end of story. Now, when you get into rental real estate, that's a little bit different. Now you're buying a home to put a tenant in. And I love rental properties. I've owned them for 35 years, but they're not without uh, the complexities work. and work and risk. And I will tell you, anyone that thinks properties don't go down in value is crazy. The Great Recession, which we just had, that started in maybe 2008, let's say, real estate was already dipping. I can tell you, I owned a property, owned two properties in Phoenix, two rentals in Phoenix, that were valued at about 225000 each, and they went down to 75000 in value. That's what can happen with real estate. My loan in both cases was about... 120,000. I went from tons of equity to negative equity and a hard time finding tenants because no one could afford to pay rent because it was the Great Recession. So there are a lot of risks in real estate. And when you buy real estate for as a rental, you really, really, really want to look at cash flow. Cash flow is very important. You got to figure out, is there enough money coming in to cover the expenses? And is there enough rent to cover downturns? Because when there's downturns, people can't afford to pay the rent and you've got to lower your rent to pay this. And, it, or, and or you have enough cash reserves to be able to float that. Now, on the other hand, when real estate goes up, 
it's great because you probably just put a down payment and you get the use of the entire property. Let's say you invested thirty thousand dollars and you and you buy a, a hundred fifty thousand dollar home in Phoenix, just to use that as an example. So now when the property, like as I did, I bought it for one fifty, now it's worth about two hundred ten thousand, right? So if I put down thirty thousand, it's now worth it's it's now worth two hundred ten, so it's sixty thousand more. So I've tripled my money. Now it took me a long time because of the Great Recession, but if I'd hit the timing right, yeah, you can make a ton of money in real estate, but you can also lose, lose a bunch everything. of money, yeah, right. lose everything. And here's what happened: was people couldn't afford to pay the mortgage payment because they had to lower the rent. They couldn't find tenants to cover the mortgage payment. They couldn't pay the mortgage payment. Hence the foreclosures, the short sales, all the stuff that happened, 2008, 2009, 2010. So I, I would sum it up by saying that. If you are so inclined to do real estate, treat it as if it were a, a business, a company, another job, because there's a lot to it. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. You can also make a ton of money at it, but I would certainly not want to bet the farm on that as my only investment. You need cash flow and you need time. Yeah. And it doesn't, it sounds like he's got time, but I don't know about cash flow uh, if he wants to do a rental. Anyway, but th there's so many errors in the, the thought process with this individual. A um, couple of things that I see is that, all right, I have um, his income is between forty five and sixty thousand bucks, and he's looking at municipal bonds. Right. You need four hundred thousand dollars of income for municipal bonds today to make sense. <laughs> True. Because interest rates are so low. We had one of our analysts, right, that did um, some work on municipals versus corporates versus governments, because of where interest rates are. Right? I mean, the 10 year treasury is at a point and a half, and you got the 30 year at two and a half. Right? So, right, this is unprecedented times when it comes to interest rates. And so, the municipal bonds, right, they pay you a little bit less, but it's tax free. But you have to be in a giant tax bracket today for municipals to, you know, to really have the value at as they did years ago. Or sure. You know, a few years ago when interest rates were, let's say, at maybe normal levels, whatever that normal level is anymore. Right. So, no, municipal bonds does not make any sense because, A, you're not in a high enough tax bracket. You could probably get a better yield on a corporate bond or even a government bond, uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Another thing he says is that, all right, well, here, housing is overvalued. How do you know that? Do you have a crystal ball? I mean, what, what, right? It's like uh, this stock is overvalued or this stock is undervalued. It, it, no one really, if, if it's so, th that's another kind of miscommunication um, or there, there, there's misinformation there. Or, hey, I'm waiting for the bubble to burst. So, should I just sit in cash? Or, you know, so it, it's just taking a look at, all right, well, here you got $60,000 to invest. How old are you? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the goals? Are you looking at retirement? Are you looking at, uh, you, you might have a long term time horizon. If it's your primary residence and you think it's overvalued, it's a primary residence. You're probably going to live there for quite some time. And if it's 25% higher in your area versus other towns, well, your area might be a little bit more desirable there's place to live. Probably a reason for it. There's that. a reason for it. You know, I live in Southern California. I am from Minnesota. I'm telling you, the cost of homes in Southern California is a little bit different than Minnesota. I do not think my home is overvalued because it cost more to live in Southern California than it did in Robbinsdale, Minnesota, right? And if uh, you're waiting for the next bubble to burst, if you have information that we don't know, I'd gladly like to talk to you because no one has that information. So you just, uh, you, 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 you hear all the media, you know what I mean? Oh, this is overvalued and this is undervalued. It's all hogwash. Right, well, I mean, talking about the media, there are articles out there that say real estate's overvalued. There's articles out there that say don't invest in bonds because there's a bubble coming, right? right? Well, but then you take a look at, well, what are inventory levels when it sure. comes to real estate? Well, inventory is small because of, uh, oh, oh, God. Yeah, the, the, the then you on. get, yeah, and, and of course the thing is like New York City, case in point, it's overvalued. It's always been overvalued. It's oh yes, it because, always will be because everyone wants to live there. Right. Hence, that's the reason why it is. Exactly. Right? Now, will it? Could it drop? Sure. Probably it would drop if there's a, a bigger economic collapse, just like the Great Recession. And and I think you can pencil anything out, um, and determine if that investment is right for you, right? Because you're uh, you know Al's been a CPA for many many years and he's very good with numbers. And so when you look at real estate, you can pencil those deals out to see if this one makes sense or not. Yeah. Right. And, and there's sometimes pricing. It, it's not necessarily overvalued. The price of the house is too high for it to cash flow appropriately. 
Right. Right. It, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because if if you like Minnesota, the house might be worth two hundred thousand. Here in Southern California, it's five hundred thousand. The rents are relatively the same. If you look at cap rates, well, it makes more sense to invest elsewhere. Right. Not necessarily here because the the cash on cash return. If if you're going for cash flow, I mean, right. a, lot, a lot of people in Southern California invest for, for appreciation, right. which is fine as, as long as you know that's what you're doing. But if you do that, cash flow is probably not great, and you got to make sure you have enough reserves to cover downturns because they will happen. Be- and then also the 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 sword goes both ways, right? Because if I have a highly my house is worth five hundred thousand, and if the market drops five percent. Well, that drop in value is going to be significantly more than if I owned a two hundred thousand dollar house, right? That's true too. Yeah. <laughs> so you just kind of run the math, and um, I guess we're out of time for this. Yeah, we're getting segment. the, the hook, <laughs> We're yeah. getting the hook. All right, we got to. Uh, we'll be right back in a second. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio seven sixty KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Uh, my name is Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner with uh, Big Al Quilpine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can check us out online at um, purefinancial.com, P-U-R-E-financial.com. I'm a certified financial planner. I've uh, been helping people with their financial planning needs for a few years now. And Big Al's been doing it um, about twice as long as I have. Yeah, I guess that's about right. Over 30 years. 30 years, huh? 35 I was going to say plus. about three years. <laughs> Three years to go. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. If we keep having shows like this. Wow. <laughs> um, I got a, a couple more questions for you, Al. Okay. What do you got? This is interesting here. Um, this individual um, wrote in. He's like, how do I determine stock loss in a non-public company? Or okay. maybe like, just something that's non-traded. Okay. So he's like, I assisted a private company in obtaining a loan with the notion that the company was supposed to eventually go public instead of taking a cash um, instead of taking a cash fee for my services i um, received stock warrants in lieu of my cash the company has not gone public and has even uh, committed several security violations okay at this point it looks like the company will never go public or have any material profits i'm trying to determine what my losses may be realized from uh, this from a tax perspective. Okay, that's a that's a great question. So um, a, a lot of companies, Joe, as you know, they they allow their employees to uh, get stock options, which allows a comp uh, an employee to buy the company stock at a certain specified price, and usually they vest over time. If it's traded or not traded, right? Either one. Yeah. Either one doesn't matter. But you can buy, you can buy into a company at a certain price. If it's non traded, it just means that the board of directors sets the price based upon. Uh, co- IRS Code Section 409A. I won't get into that, but they come up with the price of the stock, and you can in- invest it. You don't have to. That's what an option is. And interestingly enough, when you get an option, there's no tax consequence. The only tax consequence is when you exercise the option. Then, if you buy it at ten dollars and it's currently worth twenty dollars, well, it went up ten dollars. So that extra ten dollars per share, that's treated as compensation, gets added to your W-2. Now, a warrant in this case is the same exact thing. It's what they give give to people that are not employees. They're independent contractors, so they get warrants. But it works the same way. It's a stock option, in, in essence. So they uh, there's no taxation generally when they receive these things. It's only when they exercise the warrant. And in the same way, when they exercise the warrant, whatever they paid for the price of that warrant to what it is right now, well, that's that's compensation. And in that case, it's going to be 1099 ordinary income. They're an independent contractor. So that's how that happens. So in this case, he's like, all right, well, maybe his fee would have been $100,000. Sure. Instead of taking the fee for $100,000, they gave him a warrant and saying, hey, now you own $100,000 of our company. That's correct. Yeah, and so and now the company is worthless, let's just say. Let's sure. make it real simple. So. Yeah, in in essence, you lost a hundred thousand dollars, but you you didn't actually pay for it. You never paid taxes on that, so therefore, unfortunately, you don't get a tax deduction. So you you basically gave up your time. You didn't get paid for your time. You never paid taxes on these dollars. So there's a concept called tax basis, and if you don't have tax basis, there is no loss. And I know that's an unfortunate thing. It's the same idea, Joe. When when uh, uh, let's say an attorney will come to us and say, well, hey, listen, I volunteered all day. And I normally charge 400 bucks an hour. So can I take $400 times eight? So $3,200, that's my charitable deduction. 
No, it doesn't work that way because you can't deduct your time. And in essence, this is the same exact thing. There's no, there was no original investment, so there's nothing to write off. Because it was time. How about this? But he also gave a loan to that company. Okay, so that's different. So if, to the extent there's a loan, and if it's uncollectible, then that's a that's a bad debt, and a bad debt is treated generally as a as a capital loss, for better or for worse. So you can only net it against capital gains. In other words, other stock sales, real estate sales, things like that. How about if I invested in, um, like a land deal, right, that was going to be developed, and so I give half a million bucks. And they were going to build a shopping center, and they were going to get it zoned, right? And then it was going to be worth ten million dollars. Sure. But the zoning didn't go through. Okay. The, um, shopping centers not going through. Okay. Um, the, the I can't really get my money back because they're still looking to try to get other deals okay. and everything else. And maybe it's now been ten years. Sure. And I need just to rid myself of this. What 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 do I do then? Can I take that as a five hundred thousand dollar loss on my return? What what determines the loss? Yeah, that's a really good. Le- question. I mean, because there's yeah. no liquidity there, right? Correct. So what determines the loss, Joe, is is kind of a some kind of a event that happened during the year to where there was value at the beginning of the year and there was not value at the end of the year, such as a foreclosure or such as a bankruptcy or something like that. But if they're still trying to work the deal. Sure. You, 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 you I just I, uh, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do except for if you forfeit can, your if, shares if, potentially. If you, well, you could do that, or you could convince your friend to buy the shares for a hundred thousand. Got it. Right, and now you bought. You have a four hundred thousand dollar, five hundred thousand dollar purchase, hundred thousand dollar sale, four hundred thousand dollar loss. It's a capital loss, unfortunately. That so wouldn't you, be ordinary. No. No, it's not ordinary because it's it's an investment as opposed as opposed to business. When you have rental real estate and you sell that at a loss, that's considered a business with the tenant, and so then generally you can take an ordinary loss. On that that, that's what twelve thirty one. Correct. Yeah. So these REIT deals. Yeah, yeah, those are those are tough sometimes because they're they're trying to renegotiate exactly, and, and so they're just sitting on it, sitting and on and it, you sitting haven't, on it. You haven't got any sort of, of dividend payment or anything for years. And you're just thinking, this is nuts. Let me just write this off. Right. And you can't, unless there's, unless you can point to some event that happened during the year as to why it's now worthless. So that's a tough one. All right. Here's one last one for you. Okay. Um, let's see. What is the best way to transfer or refinance through a quick claim? Okay. All right. Quick claim deed. Mm-hmm. Quit. Quit claim. Quit. Quit. Quit claim. Yeah, quit. It is quit. A lot of people think it's quick. Quit. It's quit. It's quit. 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 I have uh, made all uh, payments related to, to the home I currently live in. Okay. However, it is my it's in my sister's name due to the fact that I do not qualify for a mortgage loan back in 2009. Okay. Today, we would like to finally transfer this property to my name. What is the best way to do this with minimal or zero tax consequence? If you suggest a quit claim... Uh, the property still has a mortgage note. So would there be a problem in doing a quit claim in this case? Can I do a quit claim in my name with the potential to refinance, even though the loan note is solely in my sister's name? That's a good question, because this, this really did happen. A lot of these, and in a lot of cases, it happened with parents and kids during the Great Recession, or sometimes kids and parents. It could, could go the other way. So if um, you can put the property in your name with a quit claim deed, and that's There's, a gift. Right. Well, yes and no, Joe. I, I'll, I'll come back to that in one okay. second. It could be. But uh, in this case, I, I would sort of say it's probably not a gift only because it, basically it's in the sister's name just so he could buy it. It's, I mean, in all practical purposes, even though she has legal title, it's kind of his. He's the one that's used it and paid for it this whole time. So you could make that argument. Right. But there's <laughs> there could be a gift tax consequence. But in this case, let's say you do a quit claim deed. And you make the argument that it w- really was his home, it just was financed in her name and so forth, then, uh, yeah, nothing much happens. There's no tax consequence. The bank won't necessarily like it, though, because they're, they're, if they find out about it, they'll probably call the loan. There's a due on sale clause. So if you're going to do that, you might want to wait until you get the refinance in order and do the quit claim deed in, in harmony or at the same time as the refinance. All right, so, all right, let's we'll walk through the mechanics here because I am – 
working, I'm living in a home and you're refinancing it. Right. Or no, let's say I'm living in the home and you financed it. And now I got my credit back in order. Okay. So I call a mortgage broker and say, hey, um, I want to refinance a home that I don't necessarily own, but I really own, but it's not on paper. So how, how do I do that? Well, I think you personally, I would say uh, the <laughs> I, right. Yeah, it, I I would suspect the lender, as long as they went along with this, they would they would um, probably have some kind of paperwork for the sister um, to sign in this particular case that she's going to relinquish the property upon the refinance. You know, I, I suspect that's what, what would happen. The um, you know, you did bring up a good point about gift taxes because if if let's let's say on the other hand, a more conservative approach would be whatever the equity was in the home, then the sister when they when she does the quit claim deed over to him could be construed a gift, and and the sister would have to do a gift tax return. But what I was saying was if the if the kind of the incidentals of ownership, if it really was intended to be him and he's lived in it, he can show he's lived in it, you could you could very likely argue that it's not a gift. But then the, the main thing is you'd have to get the new lender on board. you got to sit down with a smart, I guess, mortgage broker and right. say, and with the sister and him right. and say, all right, well, this is the deal. This, this is, is what this we're is doing. What Check we... my credit. Do I qualify? Yeah. And then do I qualify? Here's the home that I want to refinance. She's going to quit claim the deed. Here's her yeah. you know, documentation. I think you go through the whole thing, what happened, why, really honest, right. and say, can, can you do something? All right, we got to take another break. When we get back, what, are we going to wrap this show up, Miguel? I think we are. All right, we'll be back in a second. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here, certified financial planner, Big Al Clopine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. Go to uh, purefinancial.com. Get more information about us, about our firm, about what we're doing. Hey, a couple of things quickly is that we have a learning center on our website. Go to our website. We have 300 videos or maybe it's 400, whatever. A lot of videos. Um, quick, short stints. Al and I do a TV show. We're on tomorrow, Channel 8, right here in San Diego on uh, 760. Or I guess it's KFMB, Channel yeah, 8. Channel 8. Uh, 6.30 a.m. Sunday mornings, Your Money, Your Wealth TV style. If you haven't checked out the TV show, please do so. If you want to look at old episodes, you can go to our website at purefinancial.com to check that out, or YouTube, or wherever else that we're on. Um, but I will be teaching a retirement planning course from now until the middle of November. Wow. Four nights a week. Uh, so that's a lot of days. October's busy. We're in the fall season, right? Back to school. Uh, so if you want to have, um, go to our website and we'll show you our schedule um, of our teaching schedule. So we'll be at University of San Diego, San Diego State, Southwestern College, Cuyamaca College, Grossmont College, Maricosta and San Alejo, and in Oceanside and Escondido, uh, just to name a few. <laughs> so if you are in any of those areas, and if you would like to go through a comprehensive retirement planning course, go to our website at purefinancial.com, and you can learn all about this course. It's six hours. The goal of the course is really to help you understand in a classroom setting everything that you need to know about retirement. Six hours might seem long, but the biggest complaint I really do get after I get done with that six hours is that they wish there was more time. So we break it out in two nights. It starts at 6.30, ends at 9.30. Uh, so, like I said, San Diego State, USD, Cuyamaca College, Grossmont College. Um, we're at San Alejo, Oceanside, Escondido, um, South Bay, um, at Southwestern. And we just wrapped up Coronado. I don't know if I'll be back at Coronado. I don't think so until next year. So, uh, just go to our website at purefinancial.com. ton of um, resources there just to really, um, we're trying to lead the way with education. So, um, go to that website. I have four retirement expenses that may catch your surprise. <laughs> okay, what are they? Let's see if medical expenses, co-pays. Okay. Is, do you think that's going to be a surprise for anyone? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, well, not that it's going to happen, but it, it will be probably larger than you think. Long-term care expense. Yeah. Do you think that's going to be a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good article. <laughs> Well, I wanted you, to end the show with a bang. You know what, though, Joe? A lot of people don't realize long-term care is not covered by Medicare. So <laughs> that is something you got to pay for yourself. So just be aware of that. Well, once again, our crack. Um, 
I've got eight must-do financial tasks before year end. All right. Well, you got a minute and a half yeah, to go through. Yeah, rapid fire. You'll love some of these. Contribute to a health savings account. All right. Health <laughs> savings, pre-tax. If you have one. If you got one. Yeah. It's yeah. a high-deductible <laughs> health plan that you need through an employer. Yeah, $3,350 for an individual, $6,750 for a family if you have an HSA-type plan. Use your flexible spending account. So if you've got one, it's like a cafeteria plan. Uh, th- some of these plans are, are use or, or if you don't use, you lose it, right? you got a minute to go through seven. Yeah, maximize your retirement plan. <laughs> I got, I've got this in the bag, man. <laughs> so <laughs> 401ks, $18,000. That's what you can put in. you still got time to get some more money into that thing. And if you're over 50, you can do an extra $6,000 catch-up. And a lot of times that catch-up is a whole separate election uh, as far as your employer. So make sure that you've got that elected. Rebalance your portfolio. And that will create potentially tax loss harvesting, right? Because if you create some losses on your non-retirement accounts, you can save money <laughs> on your capital gains. Consider a Roth conversion. We already talked about that earlier. How about give back to charity? I like it. Because you give to charity over, um, you know, by December 31st, you get a write-off. And I told you this at the onset of the show. Watch the timing of your 529 plan distributions. <laughs> That's the best of all, right? But, uh, I mean, I suppose it does apply in some cases. Like, for example, you take out $529 in December, but you spend it on tuition in January. Well, that's a you can't do that. It has to be spent in the same year. I mean, I think a lot of what you just said kind of revolves around a, a message uh, that I think a lot of people miss. And um, it's taxes, right? You want to look at a health savings account that saves you money in taxes. You want to look at maxing out your retirement accounts. You want to look at Roth IRAs. You want to look at Roth conversions, rebalancing from a tax last harvesting standpoint to either, you know, making sure that you're buying low, selling high, um, right? You want to be looking at all sorts of different things. And I think a lot of times they miss some of the just the key elements when it comes to tax planning. Well, I think that's true, Joe. And and when you think about it, taxes really don't stop when your paycheck does. In fact, um, when you start tapping your retirement nest egg, there's all kinds of new rules. You got to know what they are. You got to get your required minimum distribution. You got to know how much to do. Do you take money out of a Roth IRA, non qualified account, right? You got taxes there. Instead of contributing, which is kind of on autopilot to your tax deferred plans, you got to figure out what a tax efficient distribution plan is. And I'll tell you, when you're near retirement, Tax planning becomes more important than ever. But you must use a forward-thinking tax strategy if you want to pay less taxes because you really do have more control over paying taxes in retirement, actually more than you think, probably more so than any other time in your life.